Welcome to the new extra runde of Biathlon with Ron and Hendrik. Today, the interview with Sebastian Samuelsson, hunting down Johannes Bö and Benedikt Dolph for silver, the risky call in front of the World Championships and all eyes on Beijing. Hendrik, we are back with another episode in English and uh, yeah, English, it's always tough for us, right? So uh, <laughs> sure, it's yeah. another challenge. <laughs> yeah, another special. I think it's special number nine. Yeah, exactly. And this time it's uh, Sebastian Samuelsson from Sweden. So the first Swedish guy here on our show. Yes, hopefully not the last one. Yes, I hope so too. And um, yeah, it's Of course, pretty interesting to have the world's number six here in our podcast. Mm -hmm. He had his best season in his career so far. He's pretty young and uh, he also was pretty long in the blue bib. You remember that in mm -hmm. uh, December? Yes. In December, it was um, yeah a little fight against uh, Stola on the right. Yeah, exactly. Before Stola overtook him. Yeah, but I, I guess the fight continues uh, in the next yeah. season. What do you think? Yeah, I think that too. And uh, I think also Janis Dahle will uh, have a little talk there with mm -hmm, those two sure, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's the last chance for all three of them, I think, uh, to, to capture the blue bib. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that will be interesting. But they all might also be uh, a contender for the big crystal globe and the yellow bib, you know. So it might also go over Johannes Ding's bow and the yellow bib mm -hmm. to win that blue bib. Yeah, I think I'm not alone when I say Sebastian made huge improvements over the last two seasons. Yeah. And I'm really uh, hyped to see him in the big Olympia season next year. Yeah, and I think he's also pretty hyped uh, and yeah. <laughs> he is uh, also pretty focused on the medals. So yeah, he got clear goals, mm -hmm. but uh, more of that in that episode. Yeah, and I also think he's one of the contenders for a medal in one of those mm -hmm. individual races. So um, for sure, he will be a favorite next season, I think. Yeah, and I also think during the World Cup, there are many World Cup wins uh, that he can catch. Yeah, for now, he only got uh, one World Cup victory in a Conti Lachti, Conti Lachti, the, the first yeah. pursuit of the season mm -hmm. was his first World Cup victory. So yeah, I think it will probably not be his last one. He's uh, <laughs> so young yeah. and uh, has so much more World Cup races to go. But yeah. he already has a lot of World Cup races as he's uh, pretty long in, the, in mm -hmm. the World Cup. Yeah, Henrik, I'd say let's jump right into the episode and uh, hear what Sebastian Samuelsson has to say or had to say to us. Yes, so enjoy the story of Sebastian Samuelsson, how he became a bite lead and uh, yeah. His journey so far in biathlon and what he is up to in the future. Yeah, right. So, as always, we wish you a lot of fun with this episode and let's go, Ron. Yeah, exactly. Let's go. So, Sebastian, you're the first Swedish bifleet here in our show. So it's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure for you having me. It's <laughs> yeah. nice to be here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sebastian, um, for the beginning, let us go back to your origin story. And yeah, please tell us how did it come that you decide to become a biathlete? Yeah, I uh, I had tried cross-country skiing. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, When I was younger, we lived uh, in the more southern part of Sweden and Then we moved up to a place called Sleftio. It's kind of the middle, but there you at least have snow during the winters. And mm -hmm. uh, I tried cross-country skiing. And uh, just one year later, it was the Swedish championships in biathlon where we lived. And uh, I was up there watching them. It was, uh, you know, Helena Ekholm, Björn Ferry. Mm -hmm. Even Jürgen Brink was competing at that time. And uh, <laughs> I remember it was very windy and they missed all the shots. <laughs> so it was more like a cross-country competition, but it looked fun and I, I tried it. And uh, if I'm being honest, I think in the beginning, it was mostly for me to being able to practice uh, cross-country skiing two nights more a week. But I, I like shooting, but I was really bad at shooting. And uh, then I tried more and more and I started competing and I thought this is more fun. It's uh, not only cross country skiing, it's uh, shooting as well. And uh, yeah, then I just thought it was very fun. So I, I did both sports. And then when I started the, the ski gymnasium, I had to choose between uh, biathlon and cross country. Mm -hmm. And uh, I chose biathlon because I believe that if I do biathlon, I can still have good cross-country training but I don't lose the shooting so it was for me the way of not being able to choose that early and then I did the AOF the European Youth Olympics and uh, I actually had two medals there and uh, after that uh, Wolfgang came back to Swedish biathlon again and mm -hmm. uh, he took me up to the A team and after that it has been 
biathlon 100 for me mm. do you know uh, at which age you started cross-country skiing yeah i was around uh, it was 2006 so i was uh, nine. Oh, oh that's yeah pretty young but i think it's not so young for a swedish guy right no actually if if i compare to many of my other uh, cross-country skiers uh, competing they had been on their skis since they was able to walk so i was far behind in the beginning but i i thought it was a lot of fun and i I trained and I, I thought it was fun and uh, it went better and better. Did you some other sports before? Yeah, I tried some football and I mm -hmm. did some uh, floorball and this kind of sports. I have always liked sports and I think it's really fun to do. But it was quite early for me that I decided that it's skiing and biathlon I want to do. And was it always your focus to be uh, a professional athlete one day? Yeah, I think so. I think I had that quite early that I I, I dreamt about it, of course. And uh, I, I wanted to being able to, you know, do this full time, be on the world championships in the Olympics, compete for Sweden. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this was something I really looked for. And uh, yeah, it's sometimes you need to stay up and see that I actually made it, even though mm. it's sometimes when you are 10, 11, 12, it's, yeah. it's hard to imagine. Yeah. I also could imagine that. But um, now I want to jump back to your first steps into the World Cup. That was in the season 2016-17 and you were the Rookie of the Year with a 43rd place in the total score. And uh, that's an award that's gone now. There's now the U25 award. But it was your first big award. Does it still have any yes. meaning for you, that uh, Rookie of the Year award? Yes, it does. I I remember that season very well. It was, you know, when you're so close to being able to compete at the World Cup level, you, you, you dream about it and you want to do it. And then in the beginning of the season, it was like, okay, Sebastian, you can you can try your session in the in the first World Cup, and then we see what what happens with you and uh, how how it goes and so. Mm -hmm. I remember I shot clean in my first ever World Cup race, and uh, it uh, was going to take a lot of races uh, more to do that again. But I did it in my first race, and I was 19th in the sprint in session and for me that was uh, unbelievable. I didn't uh, realize that I could have that, have that level and. Uh, After that, I have been competing on the World Cup and the first season I was always fighting for points. I wanted to be in the top 40 and I managed to do that a lot of the times. But still always have this, you know, young feeling that you you have no pressure. You can just do what you want. Mm -hmm. And if you have a bad race, it doesn't matter. It's always a new race. And yeah, yeah it, it was a lot of fun and I got a lot of experience from it. And even though I was quite young going into the World Cup, I always felt that I had a lot of time to to adjust to the level. Yeah. And Sebastian, um, what do you think of the U25 award in comparison to the Rookie of the Year? I, I think it's an improvement. I think it's uh, mm -hmm. it's more clear yeah. and I think it's fun. For us this year it was a little bit special because the blue bib was somewhat yeah, what should I say? It it was not the fight for the blue bib, it was the fight for the yellow bib. Yeah. So it was It was special in that way, uh, but I think it was nice and I had it some races in the beginning and mm -hmm. next year I want to have it more. <laughs> yeah, and in your second season, you were 44th in the total score, but it was also an Olympic season. And yeah, the big event in Pyeongchang 2018, you were one of the big surprises here. You won silver in the pursuit and gold with the relay with only 20 years of age. So uh, quite impressive. And that was the first time you stepped into the spotlight in international biathlon, I'd say. So um, let's maybe first concentrate on that pursuit. You started from yeah. rank 14 in the sprint and won silver in the end in a thrilling last lap against uh, Benedict Doll. And uh, going into that pursuit, what did you expect out of that race? I think, actually, I want to start with the sprint because it was the debut and uh, I had three mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I remember standing on the last standing shooting in the sprint and was thinking... Now I need a good shooting, otherwise I will not race the pursuit. But my skiing time was much better than ever. I, yeah. I had a really good skiing time. And finishing that race, I think, in 14th place. And uh, and I was thinking like, oh shit, today I had a chance to do something really good. I could be an Olympic medalist today, but I <laughs> messed up on the shooting range. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people can say that, but for me it was... It was hard because I felt that this might have been my chance mm -hmm. and I didn't take it. And I have a very clear memory from uh, seeing Michelle Kreshmar in the mix zone crying because he took a medal. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, ah, 
it could be me and uh, <laughs> uh but 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 still i felt that uh, it was a very good position for me it was my first olympics and i i, I didn't think about medals before going to pyeongchang mm-hmm. and uh, when the pursuit then started i just wanted to have fun and to do my race and it was quite windy that day and i thought okay i should i will need good shooting in uh, prone shooting and then everything is possible but I didn't think about medals because for me it was so surrealistic. And I think halfway through the competition, I started to realize that, okay, this is a really good race now and I have a big chance of doing something very good. And But at that point, it was so easy for me to put that thoughts away because it was so surrealistic. Of course, I will not take an Olympic medal, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is fun, but in the end, the others are much better biathletes than I am. So... It was easy to not put pressure on myself. And uh, I felt that we had really good skis and I felt strong on the skis. And that uh, gave me confidence to be uh, take my time on the shooting range. And I remember missing the first standing shot. And then I thought, okay, yeah, now, now the race is over. But it was fun until here. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, going into the penalty loop and seeing everyone else except for Kad doing the same. And uh, uh, then, uh, then I felt this is a really good race still, and I have got got a new chance now. And I remember Johannes Lucas screaming to me uh, in the fourth loop that you do your thing, the others will put pressure on you. It doesn't matter for you. The others they fight for this medal, and you just do what you normally do. It's mm-hmm. not a big thing, mm-hmm. and uh, still so surrealistic. And I remember hitting all those targets and looking at the big screen and see, oh shit, I'm number three. Where are all the other guys? And they went into the penalty loop. And I think I have never skied so fast out from the stadium in any competition. And I did that day. And after leaving the stadium, I thought, okay, this will be a hard final loop now because it, it's, it's tough and I don't know how far behind the others are. And I also thought, okay, bronze medal, this is, this is a dream, dream come true. It's, it's fantastic. I, I I'm very happy. But then I realized that okay, but Dol, he's not so far before me. I can still fight for it, and uh, with great skis. And uh, I think I had just yes, this magical run of my life. Mm-hmm. I managed to beat him in the final loop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were seven seconds behind Benedict Dol um, when you came out of the shooting range. So the last loop was very crazy. And what did you think about on those last meters in front of the finish line? It's a very hard question. It's it's a lot of emotions. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, I think, some bit of shock. I couldn't believe it. It was, you know, you look at the result list thousand times to see if this, if this is really true. And... Uh, It was just this explosion inside that, wow, I'm an Olympic medalist. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it was one of the best days of my life, I have to say. Yeah, and your skiing time, as you said, was pretty good. I think you were the fastest man on that day. So that's, yeah, very impressive with only 20 years. And it probably is your biggest achievement, uh, individual achievement so far. Mm-hmm. But uh, there also was the gold medal in the relay. And it was a pretty windy race. Did you as a team think about winning gold here in front of the race no we didn't but i think you have to consider that we had two weeks in pyeongchang and yeah. i took my silver medal hanna won the individual race for mm-hmm. the women's race the women the day before our relay took a silver medal it was like our success that we couldn't believe before was even possible to happen it was yeah. just never ending so we was like in trance or something it was <laughs> we were just uh, we were just competing and everything worked for us mm-hmm. and uh, i think we, we were just so happy everyone of the last two weeks that we competed out of joy and uh, we also knew that windy conditions is good for us we had won the relay in oberhof when it was a lot of fog and we knew if it is tricky conditions we have a chance and uh, we had great skis and everybody did a good job and we was always up there in with the top teams and uh, yeah in the end we we took the win um sebastian but why were you so good here what do you think i think we we all live in a session almost frederick didn't but the rest of us did and i think mm-hmm. we have we are used to uh, windy conditions mm-hmm. it's often wind here and uh, i think that was of course one uh, one thing that uh, helped us a lot and then i also think that we uh, i mean olympics is special and it's always the the teams who are the most favorite or the persons who are the most favorites they have the toughest time of course and 
I think everybody expected Norway to win that relay mm. uh, or maybe France. And yeah. you see France, they have a penalty loop in the first leg and then they are out of the race. Germany was always up in top two, but but maybe not doing the best relay they they did uh, before. And uh, so I think we just, we, we overachieved a little bit while many of the favorites had a tough time. And mm. I think that's... Uh, quite normal when it comes to this kind of races when the stakes are so high mm, yeah for sure but i think with those achievements you were one of the big yeah contenders or the big hopes for the future especially in sweden or also in the whole biathlon field but in the uh, 18 19 season you were 22nd in the total score was an improvement in comparison to the season before but uh, in 1920 you declined a little bit with a uh, 28th place in the total yeah. score and uh, in those two seasons you only had like three top 10 results i think after the olympics so it seems that you could not really progress from your performance at the olympics in pyeongchang what happened in that time i i uh, i agree with you with, with what you say i think i had a tough time after the olympics and even now it's hard for me to say really why it was like this. I mean, yeah. I was very close to an individual medal at home in Osasun with my fourth place in the individual race, but that was maybe mm -hmm. that race of the season that was good. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's hard to say. I, and and also now when I had a successful last season, it's people ask me, what did you do differently and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I did yeah. so many things differently. It's just how it is sometimes you... You train good, you think, and you do you do everything you you want to do, and so and sometimes it just doesn't work out for you. And I think also, especially the season uh, you said 1920 was, which was bad. I have to say, then I think I did, I didn't start the season good, and then you start to think. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, as you said, I after the Olympics, I had more eyes on me, and especially in Sweden, people wanted me to. To be the next biathlon star from Sweden, and yeah. I didn't realize it at the time, but I think it was quite tough for me to to deal with that uh, extra pressure. And uh, yeah, I just didn't get my full uh, capacity out, and mm. it's hard for me to say why actually. Mm. And how was it mentally for you to not be able to yeah compete uh, with the best? It, it's tough because I mean, if I compare. My first season in the World Cup, you're just happy to compete and it's nice to be on the World Cup mm -hmm. level and so. But after medals in the Olympics and, and some other podiums, uh, then you you want to be there the whole time and you you want to at least feel uh, that you have a chance of doing it. I remember going to the 2020 World Championship in Antols and ever since the Olympics, I have thought, okay, but I want to win medals in the championships. But going to Antols, it was not... Of course, you, you never stop believing, but mm. I, I knew that it will be something extraordinary if, if I'm going to turn this around and win a medal here. Mm. Um, it's not why I'm competing. I'm competing because I, I want to do good results. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And also, when you, when, it's, when you cannot put your finger on what, what it is that makes bad results, then it's even harder. Because if I knew, okay, but I did this and maybe it was not so good, I, if I change it to next year, it will be good again then it might be easier. But last year, last spring, it was a lot of thinking, what have I done? What should I do? And how can I turn this ship around? Mm. Yeah. And I think it's a struggle when you aren't um, safe for the upcoming mass start races, isn't it? Yes, of course. You feel always the pressure. Okay, if you want to be in a mass start, but I'm not 20, top 25 in yeah. the World Cup, mm -hmm. then I need a good race here. And Maybe you do a good sprint skiing, but you have some mistakes and then you're not in the must start. And then there is almost no races that weekend and then it goes on and on. And uh, yeah, if you are not uh, in good shape, then maybe sometimes you want to compete a lot, but then you miss a lot of competitions. So mm -hmm. it's mm. tough in, in that way. Okay, um, let's jump into the last season. I think with the opening in Kontilahti, you and the Swedish team showed the world that you are one of the big contenders for the World Cup. And uh, you also showed very big improvement in your skiing times. You had crazy skiing times in Kontilahti. Mm -hmm. So what do you think you did right in the summer in comparison to the season before? I mean, you just said uh, there wasn't so much difference. But yeah, also with the mental breakdown, uh, I think it's not easy to come back with such a strong performance. I think it was... 
even if it's hard to say, I think it was many factors. I think, of course, I trained a bit more. I, I trained more and I, I tried to have even more quality in my training. I have always been good at having quality in trainings, but I tried to push it even more. Uh, I also worked a bit more with nutrition. Uh, I haven't done it before and, and I did more of those things. Mm -hmm. And also, I think... Even if it was not fun, the 1920 season, I think it learned me a lot. And it also gives you perspective and uh, you, you start to think, okay, I'm doing better results. And, and you start to think what's important and what's not important. And I think I, I got a more healthy view about racing. And I think that that gives me more confident competing forward that, okay, I can do a bad race, but that doesn't mean I'm a bad person and, and you know, all these kind of mm. things. So I think all those things combined uh, made it possible for me to to be up racing on a level I never had before. Mm. Even though I had the medals in Pyeongchang, I never reached that level uh, and especially not that consistency that I did uh, the last season. Yeah. And um, are there any new secrets you want to reveal here uh, in, in our small private talk? <laughs> <laughs> I think I have, of course, you, after each season, you sit down and you think, what did I do? And, uh, and uh, what do I want to do in the future? And I have some things, but I don't want to talk too much about okay. it. I have <laughs> I have a new rifle mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with some small changes. And uh, and I also have some ideas if uh, what I'm going to do physically over this coming months before the season. And uh, uh, one thing I can say is, is that what's special this season, of course, it's the Olympics, but the Olympics is in high altitude. Yeah. And uh, therefore, I will try to to be more focused to the high altitude than before. I have never really used it in my training and I have um, not so much experience about it. So this is something I will focus on now. And uh, so I will be in Italy now in uh, the late June, middle of July. And uh, yeah. then we will be with the team mm -hmm. in September in Fontrume. And also it will be some high altitude before going to Uh, Beijing. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, it a little bit later because we read that you want to go to Italy and France. But you talked about nutrition. What did you change yes. nutrition-wise? I think it's just the basics. Uh, I have never really thought about it as a big factor. Mm -hmm. I, I also thought I train a lot. I need to eat a lot and it doesn't really matter what. But to get a more understanding of you need to get protein and how often and yes. how much and uh, to make sure you have always full energy if you're going into a tough new training day and this kind of things. So I think just the basics really, but it's, yeah. it was good for me to work with someone professionally and you can say, I eat this a normal day and what do you think about this? And he says, yeah, it's good, but maybe you should drink a glass of milk as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you track your nutrition and your protein or is it just by feeling or you got some uh, rules that you say, oh, I always eat a piece of meat uh, with my meal or some... Uh, yeah, yeah, some small rules. rules. I, I think one thing I added was this uh, fast snack directly after training. Uh, now I always uh, get this uh, big glass of chocolate milk and uh, <laughs> yeah. I enjoy it a lot and... Uh, <laughs> Ah, and then it's tracking not, but it's easy to maybe take two, three days once every second month or something. And I trained this, this two days and I ate this. Uh, what do you think? And then he can say, yeah, it looks like maybe you need more carbohydrates or maybe you should uh, eat more salmon or I don't know, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the first pursuit of the season... You made it. You made your first individual victory, your first individual World Cup victory. How did it feel after nearly two years without any podium? It felt great, <laughs> I have to say. It was yeah. it was really nice. <laughs> I was Actually, I was in the second place in the sprint the weekend before. Uh, and then it was the second sprint yeah, in true, true. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, where I had uh, three mistakes. And I thought, oh, now I destroyed it. And You know, at that point, I had a good uh, position in the overall cup, and I thought it was a lot of fun. And then I thought, okay, now I'm 18. This is tough. And uh, <laughs> I think that pursuit was this race where you just, okay, I need to take as many places as I can, but for sure it will not be a podium today. And then in the end, you win. So it's sometimes it's so hard to... You, I mean, you have your expectations beforehand, but it's very often they are not true at the end. So I think... 
one thing I learned from that and many other races is that you need to fight till the end because you never know what happens. Mm. And that's, I think, is the beauty of biathlon, mm-hmm. really. I mean, it's in uh, yeah. very few sports where you have this element that you can start as number 18 and in the end you can win. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Was it different uh, from your silver medal in Pyeongchang? Uh, yeah, I think the silver medal was was crazy, but I think... I think I had actually almost more emotions this time because, mm-hmm. of course, it's a win and, and that's special. And uh, also, I think at that point, I realized how, how how hard I thought it was the season before when I was not reaching that top level. And uh, I think for me, it was this sign that, okay, now I'm back at the top mm-hmm. of the field and I can do really good races. And it was, you know, just this nice feeling of, Ooh, um, I can do this good and um, it will be a fun season. Mm. Yeah, but after Conchi Lachti, I think everyone thought that you might be unbeatable in that season. The whole Swedish team was so <laughs> strong there. But already in Ophilsen, uh, your performance declined. So uh, was it just that Conchi Lachti is your perfect World Cup venue or did you leave all your powers in Finland there? <laughs> uh, I think I think it's uh, some uh, many r- small reasons. I think First of all, the whole Swedish team, we had great skis in Kontolakti. Maybe we had the best uh, skis of all, and I think that that was a big factor for us. Also, I always feel uh, in Hockfields, and I don't know why, because it's not so high altitude there, but always coming down there the first days are heavy for me there. So I think all, already the second week in Hockfields was better, but uh, I shot clean in both sprints, and I was number five, and I think it's in both sprints, and I think... It, it, of course, you want to be on the podium the whole time, but I think it was still a consistent level, and I was very happy with that. And I think I I left off the Hochfels and being number three in the total World Cup, and yeah, uh, yeah. so I was not disappointed. I just felt that okay, this is good. I I had good shooting and um, good results. Not so many podiums, but good results. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, January was a little bit the same, or especially in Antals, it went a little bit down for you. Um, you. It seemed to be a big problem for you that high altitude there. Or was it something else that made you struggle on the skis in Antals? No, I think already in Oberhof I had uh, maybe not the best shape. Uh, yeah. It was it was struggling a bit, and uh, yeah, I remember being a little bit frustrated because I shot quite good, but mm-hmm. I had not so good results. Uh, And then Antos was just this uh, big uh, catastrophe. And uh, uh, I think I I was skiing the 20K and I think Johannes Bo started like one and a half or two minutes behind me. And on the second (laughs) loop, he overpassed me and I have no chance following him. And then I thought, this is not a good day. I think altitude is not a problem for me if I have some days there. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this was just too early for me competing and i think i saw already the relay then was a little bit better but not good and but then the must start it felt almost like normal again skiing wise yeah so i think i'm struggling with this adaption period but if i'm being there for i say 10 days then i'm back to back to normal mm-hmm. again yeah good to know <laughs> <laughs> yeah and with those races in antols oberhof and hochfilzen uh, you directly went into the world championships in pokluka sebastian how was your self-confidence after some tough weeks for you uh i tried to be positive i remember you know after december swedish media and everybody was starting to expecting medals yeah. uh, from many in the team and from me too mm-hmm. and uh I remember they asking a lot, you know, like in Antos, you're not performing good now. Are you worried? And something like this. And I remember the last interview in Antos, I said, don't you worry because I'm the best in the world of uh, <laughs> shape, uh, top shape, uh, to get in top shape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was not a joke, but it was for me, for myself to just say, it doesn't matter. I, I know what I do. And it will be good. I still have some weeks. And it was very fun now because I did a great championship. So <laughs> yes. I will live with that comment now on. So <laughs> that was good for me, I think. It would have not been so fun if I was a disaster in Pokoryuka. Then they yes. yeah. would roll this uh, a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. Talking bullshit. But no, I think I had confidence that if I do it good, it can still be good. And I knew my shooting was good. And I also felt that 
for me, I think it's a quite a big difference if I feel in shape or not. Mm-hmm. And uh, going into the World Championships, and it's two weeks left, and you, then you start to feel, okay, it feels a little bit better now. And then I think the last week coming into the championship, it feels better and better for every day. And I think that is a feeling I boost myself with. And I think uh, it gives me confidence and uh the feeling of that I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you won a bronze medal in the first race in the mixed relay. I think it gave you for the rest of the world championship some more self confidence, right? I think, especially for the team, it was very good because everybody was talking about medals and we got a medal in the first race. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it was, I struggled a bit. I did the first uh, leg and I broke my pole and I had a lot of troubles uh, changing my pole many times <laughs> during that race mm-hmm. and uh, it was this strange weather and the, it felt not so good and I was a little bit like ah this is it's not really what I want but still it's a medal mm-hmm. and uh, I just try to you know you you always look at the ski times after and you think oh, okay but if I must broke my pole what would it be like then and, and and so but I try not to think so much about it and then I think championships is you need to go into every race with everything you have and then you have to just wait and see the results. And I had great races after the mix really too. Yeah, I think the sprint was quite okay for you with an eighth place, but uh, the pursuit, that seems to be your thing. You won the silver medal yeah. here. And uh, what probably is more impressive is your last lap against Johannes Tingis Bö. What did you think when you saw that he's right behind you Yeah, after that last shooting, right? Yeah, I think already in the fourth loop i knew he was chasing us and uh it was i knew i need to put some speed on this lap otherwise he <laughs> will just yeah. take 15 20 seconds easily mm-hmm. and i think he managed to take maybe 10 seconds or something and then he had a fast shooting and going out i see okay i'm in second place uh, and i think he was three seconds behind me or something and i thought oh i don't i don't want him on the last loop <laughs> i mean out of every people not him And then, then also that race was we pushed a lot the first the first loops. So I was very tired at that point, and I thought, okay, for me, it's no chance to go full gas from here and out ski him because he's too strong. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, okay, I go out from the stadium in a okay pace. He for sure will catch up with me, and then I will just try to do everything I can to follow him as long as possible. But then after maybe one kilometer or so, I realized it took him some time to catch me even though I felt that I'm not going 100% mm-hmm. and that gave me that gave me more confidence okay he he has pushed a lot too and he he might be tired and and uh, I I know from before that he is very strong on skis but maybe sometimes <laughs> yeah. the final loops is not his uh, best loop yeah. uh, and he was he was overpassing me and I just tried to follow him mm-hmm. and my feeling was that he was a bit unsure of how strong I was and my thinking afterhand is if he had pushed a little bit more then he would have uh, lost me but he was I think afraid to do everything he had and then when we came into the stadium or at least on the top before the stadium we had decided before that if it is a duel I I need to be first on this point because then it's just the downhill and the the finish line. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time I thought, okay, that was the plan, but I'm too tired. If I'm on top here, he will overpass me anyway because I don't have the power to go like hell from here. So I let him be first and he pushed over uh, the top and got some meters, but then he was unsecure again. And and when we then come into the stadium and I'm just behind him, I think, okay, now it doesn't matter how tired I am. Now it's just what two three hundred meters left and i knew okay i have only one chance and i have to go in the last corner and just hope it's enough time to overpass him and he was skiing slowly and i knew he's thinking exactly the same as i am we Mm -hmm. wait for that corner and then we push everything we have (laughs) and i got a good corner and uh, i managed to overpass him and uh, yeah it was a good sprint finish for me and i don't really know how I got that powers actually. Yeah, but I think it was a lot of power. And mm-hmm. um, at the World Championships, there was also that crazy first lap of uh, Johannes where he exploded and uh, split the whole field in a single mix relay, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. 
Why couldn't you follow him there at that point? I mean, you were, I think, the second fastest guy at that point. But yeah, in comparison to the pursuit, it was possible for you. And yeah, there in the first lap, it mm. wasn't. Or was it just a clever decision by you? No, it's not a clever decision because I think at that point, you, you try to follow him. You don't. You are not leaving him just because you think he's stupid. You want to follow. But on the other hand, other hand you are not expecting it to happen. So then it's a bit strange because you don't want to kill yourself on the first mm -hmm. loop. But then he does something like that. And then you you try to follow, but you do it like with a half heart. You are, you are not, you don't want to push everything, but you still want to follow. And then you get a conflicting feeling there because if you want to follow, then you have to do everything you want. And uh, I thought, okay, I push what I have, but if he got two, three seconds, it won't matter for the race. But he was really strong there. And uh, I talked with, I think it was Hofer afterwards, and he said, I was so sure he was going to do something like that. Today. <laughs> and it was, yeah, it was, you could almost feel it at the start that he has, he is being up to something here. Yeah. And in the end, it was the bronze medal for you. And you also won the silver medal in the relay. And yeah, as you said, you're one of the most successful athletes of the World Championships 2021. So another thing we wanted to talk about is the single mixed relay in Novo Mesto, where you also did an amazing last lap against Tula holmler which won you the race there. So um, we had that crazy last lap in Pyeongchang versus Benedict Doll, now twice in Pokalyuka here in Novo Mesto, and some great last laps uh, in some sprint races. So why are you so strong on that final lap? I don't know, really. I think... It happens something with me when I see that it's possible to, to do a great race. Yeah. And, I, I, and I think it's actually quite funny this uh, last loop in November you were talking about. It. I'm going out and I, I knew that the laps before I had taken maybe two, three, four seconds on Sturla, but uh, I knew, okay, this will be very tough. And I knew I need to push everything I have and just hope I can catch him and that I have energy left for the for the sprint mm -hmm. and we ski the whole loop and I thought if I'm on the top if I'm if I'm close to him maybe I can take some down here but I was not so close on the top and then we have this last uphill into the stadium and you know you are getting this thought about okay this will be too hard you are almost giving up and then I see the Norwegian coach running uh, with Surla mm -hmm. and I was thinking to myself He looks really afraid. <laughs> and then I thought, May maybe there is a little chance because yeah. the Norwegian coach, he's screaming like hell and he's, yeah, he looked afraid. And then mm -hmm. I thought, okay, now I will do everything I can. And, you know, the first two seconds is, is the hardest, but when it's only two seconds left, then you feel already so strong. And uh, I think I, I got out everything for me that day. And I think it has been similar last loops before when you, When I don't think about how tired I am and just go. And I'm very happy I have that possibility. And I also, I think I have confidence on the last loop because I feel that I never have to take, I never have to take the initiative because for me, I feel like it doesn't matter if it's a sprint in the stadium or if we go hard, the whole mm. loop boat mm. works for me. And then it's easy to just stay behind. And if they want to go hard, I can go hard, but If they want to wait, I can mm. also wait. So I think that's a, a strong uh, factor for me. Yeah. But do you reserve some uh, energy for that? Or is it uh, a sort of uh, yeah, extra power that comes back to you? I think it's more extra power. Actually, <laughs> I, I don't think that I should go easy and then have a good final loop. Mm -hmm. I'm more thinking like I go out hard and if I shoot good and if I feel that I'm in the race for a good spot, then I know I will fight with everything I have. So mm -hmm. I just to try to put me in that position and then deal with with the with the hard work. Mm -hmm. yes. Sebastian, and then there was the final World Cup race of the season in Östersund, <laughs> the <Yes>. must start. <laughs> Tell us what was your intention with that first lap uh, together with Martin Ponciloma? Yeah, it was it was stupid to be honest, but <laughs> I had an idea before and I, I thought You know, at this point, I had raced all the 35 competitions so far, and I was really tired. Mm -hmm. And and it was, you know, the race was postponed, and it was windy, and uh, I thought, this is a strange race from beforehand. And then I thought, I felt tired, and then I thought, I need to do something that gives me energy to motivate me to do a good race. Mm -hmm. And And then I thought, okay, if I 
push like hell in the first loop, then I have something to focus on. It's a little bit fun. Uh, it's not the most important race of the season. And also it gives me, you know, sometimes when you, you race and you race against Johannes Bo or Surla or these guys, it's mm-hmm. easy to get a lot of respect. And I think if you do something like this, you take the respect out of it because you show for yourself, but also for them that I don't care how many gold medals you have or how many wins you have. I will push whatever I can do and, yes. and I will do my best the whole time. <laughs> so it was just some hours before the race. I called uh, Johannes Lucas because he was in home quarantine in Germany. And uh, mm-hmm. I told him, I think maybe I want to try something on the first loop today. He just laughed at me and then he said, yeah, if you want, do it. And uh, <laughs> then I talked to Martin and I said, we make sure we are the top guys when we are at the bottom. And then I will push everything I have and I hope you will help me in the end of the loop. And uh, we did. And I have never uh, in a World Cup race seen so many angry faces in the finish area afterwards. Because everybody <laughs> was so tired and they thought we were being very stupid uh, to put that uh, speed into the race mm-hmm. and for my for my own race i mean if i had shot good then maybe it could have been a good race but i was not shooting so good and uh, of course it was heavy legs on the on the coming uh, loops so it was not the best race of the season for me but it was i think for the future good to try it and uh, mm-hmm. you you win some respect i think so you think you want to repeat that uh, strategy in the future i uh, i think now i've done it in a World Cup race, so the next uh, step should be a championship race then. Yeah, so, Olympics, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Olympics, maybe. We will see. <laughs> we will see how, how good shape I feel in, in February. Yeah. Sebastian, um, that was the season 2021. How would you summarize your season? I would summarize it as my best season ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As we were saying before, the Olympics is maybe my biggest achievement, but it was two weeks. Uh, I think this was a whole season where I was consistent. I shot clean six out of 10 sprints. Uh, I had, uh, I think, seven podium finishes or something like that. Five, yeah, something like that. And mm-hmm. uh, I, it was it was a great season. And I, felt, I feel very proud of I'm being able to maintain that high level during the whole season. And uh, I think if you want to be one of the best biathletes, uh, and you, if you in the future want to win the total World Cup, then the consistency is most important. Mm-hmm. I'm not having the the top level required for it yet, but I can be consistent, and I, that's something I will take with me for the for the coming years. Yeah, so you're number six of the world now, and uh, the best Swedish athlete again. And you're also the best Swedish athlete for uh, yeah some years now since you're very young. So how are you able to improve when there's not really a role model for you where you can look up to? Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, my first years I had Frederick in the team and he was, you know, he was this, he was a mentor for me, I would say. And I, yeah. I remember asking him a lot uh, and tried to take everything out from him. And I think it was when I was so young, it was important to have that that guy in the team because he was also so he wanted to share he wanted me to improve and he he wanted to share his knowledge and that was very important and then i think over the years i have learned myself how what it means to be a top athlete and uh, so i think this mentor uh, role or so is is not needed in the same way now now it's more important with sparring on the trainings and then i think luckily for me i almost always really bad during summer and autumn so i like it is right now i have uh, big problems to follow the other guys if we do mm-hmm. an interval session now uphill roller skiing threshold i cannot follow the other guys they, okay, yeah. they are just they are just too strong so i think for me that's it's good because then i feel oh okay sebastian now you are behind now you need to push and do good trainings and then i know over the coming months i will be closer and closer to them and uh, in the autumn maybe I can push them on some roller ski sessions and then I know when the World Cup season starts it's completely different and uh, trust me I had many many years where I thought I'm so bad it's why should I compete at the World Cup the other guys Mm -hmm. they are so much stronger than me I have no chance 
but as soon as uh, the racing season starts it's I'm a completely new person so now when I I have learned to live with that and learned that it is that way it I see it as a strong side because I never have to worry about being the strongest guy in training and I can if I follow the others then I have a really good session yeah but, but how do you know you're training hard enough when there's uh, no one out of the top 10 in the world cup uh, around you yeah, but I think also this season will be extra uh, not special but extra good because now we've seen Martin had some really good races uh, yes. mm -hmm. and I mean skiing wise he was one of the best last season and then it's nice to to have him on the trainings and and, and you know if he skis good then uh, and I follow him then I ski good too and Jesper also skied very good many times so I think we are three guys that can have really good ski times in the World Cup and uh, I remember last year thinking when I was skiing like Martin and Jesper that uh, maybe If we are, if all three of us are equal, then maybe it's not so good because then no one of us is good enough. But yeah. it turned out that all of us was quite good skiing wise. So I think that's uh, a security for the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talking about the Swedish team, how do you split your training groups for the summer preparation? For example, in Germany, um, there's an A squad and a B squad and so on. But how is it in Sweden? Yeah, we are we are like we are one A team, uh, and that's mm -hmm. mainly the people competing at the World Cup. And uh, we all of us live in Östersund, so then it comes natural that we, we train a lot together and especially in the morning sessions. And we often or almost always have a coach at the shooting range. Mm -hmm. So then we decide, okay, tomorrow we start at 8.30 and then everybody is there and we do a good session together. And uh, especially if, it is a, if it's a hard session, it's good that we, we train together. And then in the afternoons, often it's maybe you go to gym or you have a more easy session and then it's, more often that we train alone so i think this is a good mix we we get the sparring together on the hard sessions but also you feel that you you do your own training sometimes mm -hmm. is uh, men and women separated in sweden no we are in the same team and we mm -hmm. always go on the same camps and so mm -hmm. and right now we are i think five boys and seven girls in the team and uh, yeah we we train together Yeah, yeah, I think that's a different approach from the other nations, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm yes. correct. Yeah, that might be. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good mix because if you are on a camp and you are boys and girls together, it's I mean I think it's a more more uh, homogeneous group. Mm -hmm. I would say it's you 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 get everything uh, in in the same group, and it's yeah I think it's it's nice. And then of course we don't we have the same uh, trainings, but. Of course, we ski a little bit faster than them do, but uh, it doesn't matter. You can still, I mean, there is a lot of things I can learn from Hanna or mm -hmm. Stina and uh, the opposite too. So I think it's a strong side that, that we can do it together. Yeah, and the team in the whole is a very young team, right? So um, you already showed uh, or have a lot of World Cup experience and uh, I think there's a big potential in your team with you, Martin Ponce de Oma, the Urbex sisters, Stina Nilsson and so on. Do you think you might be the so-called golden generation in Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I hope so. I think, I mean, Swedish biathlon, you, you have always had this one or two or three good uh, athletes and uh, then you have some years with no good athletes and then it mm -hmm. goes... It goes in waves for us because we don't. Before we didn't have so many biathletes, and I, I think uh, this is something we see now. We we get more and more people in Sweden interested in biathlon and doing biathlon, and I think that's that gives us more people to take off. And uh, uh, yeah, as you said, we are a young team, and we have been the almost the same team for many years now, and we know each other well, and we we push each other, and I think this is uh, something we we benefit from, and uh, uh, also we have most of us have many years left in biathlon, so I think that's yeah. that gives us time to do something good. Yeah. Um, let's have a look into the future. What are your main goals for the upcoming season? Yeah, uh, it's. Maybe a boring answer, but it's easy to say. Uh, it's it's the Olympics, of course. Uh, yeah. I want to win medals in mm -hmm. in Beijing, and uh, that's the that's the main goal I have. And 
the World Cups are always important for us. I mean, uh, the World Cup is is maybe the most important in biathlon, but mm-hmm. Olympics is still something very special. And I think this time going into my second Olympics, I realize it even more how special it is. The first time I knew it was special, but I hadn't feel it. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I both knew and can remember the feelings from being at the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but will you neglect any uh, races in the total score in the World Cup? We are, we are uh, talking about it and wondering, and I think you have to be, you, you need, of course, a plan now, but you need also being able to change the plan. Uh, and uh, it might be so that you skip maybe one weekend or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will see how the season goes. And uh, Olympics is most important, but you don't want to neglect the World Cup too much. Mm. But isn't it uh, too hard to go uh, after both? Yes, it, it might be. And also, as I was uh, talking about with the high altitude, I, yeah. I really want to be on altitude uh, quite some time before the Olympics. And if you look how close the competition schedule is when it, the competition is in Antos, yes. and then it's not so long time before the Olympics. So it might be so that you skip one of the World Cups in January to to prepare more and then in high altitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you were also uh, one of the big contenders for the Blue Bib this season and uh, in the upcoming season it's your last possibility to win that Blue yes. Bib in the <laughs> Under-25 award. So isn't that uh, something you're interested in? Yes, of course. The, the Blue Bib is important and uh, I, I want to fight for it. Uh, yeah. But I also feel that... You know, I want to improve more, and I was sixth in the in the overall cup now. And the blue bib is important, but if you feel that you can fight for the yellow bib, that's even more important. So I think, and that is something I will have for many years. So yeah. I think the blue bib is fun, but it's the yellow bib you want. Yeah, to me, it uh, sounds like a lot of pressure on your shoulders mm-hmm. uh, when you want to grab some medals and uh, also win some other competitions but uh, in Pyeongchang you were like the underdog no uh, had no pressure at winning any medals but now it's different and uh, you will be probably one of the favorites or one of the athletes everyone will look out for so mm-hmm. do you have any fears of failing well um yeah i think yes of course i think you always have it in uh, in some way mm-hmm. and it's not special for the olympics of course olympics are bigger but You always want to succeed and you always want to do good races. And uh, it doesn't matter if you do. I mean, if I win every race in the World Cup, but I take no medals in the Olympics, people will still think this was a bad season for me. So it, it is two weeks who decides a lot of how you think about this season and this year. And yeah, I just try to do my own thing and try not to focus so much on what other people think and just Just do good uh, biathlon races. I mean, if I go to Beijing and I shoot clean in the sprint and I feel in good shape, mm-hmm. I can win the race. But I can also be number five or number eight. And even though I want medals, I cannot say I'm disappointed if I have trained good and done everything I can. I shoot clean and I'm number five. Mm-hmm. Then four people were better than me and it's nothing I can do about it. So I just try to focus on myself and what I can control and do good training. I think. Much is decided in February, but we decide much this time of the year too. I mean, if you have a good training now and you are working hard, then you will have it much more easier uh, a medal in February. Yeah, but uh, that's what everyone is doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the that's yeah. the problem. I mean, you can interview maybe, yeah, I'm sure you can interview 20 or 30 biathletes, men who says, yeah, I want a medal mm. in in Beijing, but not many of us is going to take it. So yes. that's the terrifying part, but also the part who makes it fun. Because if I knew already that they would get medals in Beijing, then then it wouldn't be that fun, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, what's your opinion on going to Beijing without having seen or tested the tracks? I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, as the situation is now, it, it was nothing we could do about it, really. But of course, I think it's a bit sad and uh, boring. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember being in Pyeongchang one year before, and I thought that was good experience. And it was it was nice to see the place. Now we don't know anything about Beijing. But what we know is that the sprint will still be 10 kilometers. We will ski three loops, and we shot at 50 meters and so on. So yeah. I think... It will be the same like every other race. 
it's just that it, it's Olympics and that makes it so special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your plans are to go to Antholz and to France for high altitude training, you said it, and you want to train there alone, is that right? Yeah, we will. Uh, so <laughs> I will go there by myself yeah. together with my, uh, my, what do you say, my partner, my girlfriend. Yeah. Girlfriend, yes. And mm -hmm. uh, yes. And, Or uh, wife. <laughs> also, <laughs> not wife, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Johannes, uh, our coach, will also be there some days. Mm -hmm. uh, so... It's still uh, the plan I do together with him, and uh, I will do. I mean, it was a joint dis decision that we are going, and mm -hmm. uh, we both think that this is something I should do, and uh, I will uh, handle it mostly myself. But he will also be there some days, and I think it will be will be a good camp. Yeah, but uh, I mean, when you said um, it's the first time for you that you want to train like that. It seems to be a little bit risky. So why don't you just stay in Sweden and say uh, never change a winning team after your mm -hmm. successful year now? Yeah, you you could say that, but I think I think it's important. And I think I mean, if you are clever and you do it smart and you have a good follow up, I think it's not so many risks. I mean, you have a lot of studies in this area, and yeah, I I think I I don't see the risk as mm -hmm. too high uh, i will be there it will be a good training camp it will be an altitude and you need maybe to think about taking it easy and these kind of things and uh, then i will have still a lot of time in sweden and uh, then together with the team in altitude again and so so i think it really gives me more experience for the future and also even if uh, beijing is really important now it's it's if what i do now in uh, altitude in italy will be good even for coming uh, championships i mean you have 2026 olympics mm -hmm. you have in antols uh, you have a lot of other championships on altitude as well so it's important to to get this and i think now in I'm getting in that age and that stage of my career when it's natural that I try these things. Yeah, so it's more of a long-term planning thing. But you think that training in high altitude will carry over till the Olympics in February? Yeah, I think it. Will, it I think it will gives me. As you can see, that if you are many days in altitude over the year, it gives you positive uh, factors that you maybe you get used to the altitude quicker and so mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that's what I want to to see, and also I I want to see. Okay, I say now I need ten days roughly to to feel good. But can we say maybe more exactly? Maybe it's eight days or it's twelve days, mm -hmm. and and uh, what day is it good for me to start more uh, hard training uh, and this kind of things? And I think this is good experience I will take with me going into the preparation for. Mm, yeah. Did you do any special things in front of uh, Pyeongchang 2018 uh, that you might want to repeat now? No, nothing uh, really special. No, it was it was a lot of good training, but nothing mm -hmm. special or secret. It was okay. I think I want to see Olympics as special because it gives me motivation and it gives me a lot of energy. Feeling like okay, now I'm competing at the highest level, but. Other than that, I think you should not complicate it too much. Mm -hmm. It's uh, normal races. It's a season like everyone else. And uh, I want to do good biathlon races. And if I want to do good biathlon races, then I need to practice shooting and I need to practice skiing. And then I need to have a good day in February. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Let us take a little break from biathlon. Tell us, are there any other things in life than biathlon? I think the older I get, the more... Uh, The more things you you see uh, in life in general, I think I changed a lot as a person during the the last years. Mm -hmm. I I now uh, I think I before it was more strictly biathlon. Now I'm more uh, I like to enjoy some time off, being with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, me and my girlfriend we are getting a puppy this summer probably, mm -hmm. so oh. that will be <laughs> that will be something. It's time consuming. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think my girlfriend needs to take a vacation so uh -huh. I can sleep through the night. <laughs> uh, but it's you know it's it's life is biathlon for me. It's what I do and I think it's very important. But life is also a lot of other things, and uh, I have no like special interest. But I 
I just like taking time with friends, mm -hmm. eating good dinners, and uh, just yeah, if it's good weather, you can go take a swim and uh, this kind of things. Yeah. Just to enjoy life in general. The basic yeah. stuff. Yeah. Are you also a gamer like the Norwegian or French guys? <laughs> uh, I think not as much as them. I like to play uh, FIFA, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the football game. Yeah. So I do that sometimes. But it's mostly when we are out in camps or on races sometimes too. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it's it's more fun if you are uh, more people and you can uh, you can fight each other. But these uh, shooting games I'm terrible at, so I try to <laughs> stay out of them. <laughs> yeah, they all play the shooting games, right? Uh, yeah. Call of Duty and so on. Yeah, right. I think I think I would. Uh, be ashamed if I try to fight against <laughs> some of these guys in this kind of games. So you're still a soccer fan when you uh, play FIFA? Uh, but I was more before, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I like to, I mean, I'm looking really much forward to the European Championships mm -hmm. now. I think it will be a lot of fun, but I don't really follow the club football so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I, I like all sports and I think also the Tokyo Olympics if if it will be it yeah, will yeah. be great motivation and also very fun I remember uh, Rio 2016 then oh, yeah. uh, I had the goal that I okay I want to see every Swedish medal and uh, you know it was in Rio with the time difference mm -hmm. so I and and then you had to calculate okay what should i see to don't miss a medal and uh, <laughs> i remember Sara Karlström she was swimming during the middle of the night and thought oh, this is quite short medal so now i need to set the alarm and uh, so i woke up and swimming is easy because she she swims for a minute or something and then she take take the medal and uh, i look with one eye and then i fall asleep <laughs> again so so this yeah. was uh, yeah i like sports mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Sebastian. At the end, we got a little section, questions that we always ask our guest. Okay. Question number one is, do you have any rituals before the start of a race? Actually, this was something I haven't had, but I had more of this year. Before, I was always this guy laying in bed and then going to the stadium, warming up and competing. Mm -hmm. Now I was a little bit more professional, I would say. I was doing some yoga in the morning. My girlfriend composed a yoga program for me, and I think it's good because I'm so stiff. And also, it's a yeah, a peaceful uh, start of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I I make a small run and uh, some core exercises and dry shooting. Um, then yeah. I go eating and then to the stadium, and then I'm ready to compete. Yeah, great. Uh, what's your favorite World Cup venue, except of uh, Östersund? Nove Mesto, if it is uh, okay. public, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, spectators. <laughs> Otherwise, I say Rupolding because as uh, the Swedish team, we have spent a lot of time there, and it's a uh, a place that feels almost like home. Okay, your favorite racing format in biathlon? Mm -hmm. Pursuit. Yeah, <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> um, prone or standing shooting? Standing. Yeah. I think it's more action, and it's also when the races mm -hmm. are uh, being uh, decided. Okay. What is the coolest thing about biathlon for you? I think I think the coolest thing about biathlon is the actually the atmosphere out on the races. I think mm -hmm. everybody in biathlon knows how hard it is. Everybody knows how it feels to have a penalty loop in a relay or something like that. And we can all be appreciate each other. I mean, Jacques Claire, for example, when he was this crazy pursuit in Pokeryoka, the standing shooting, yeah. everybody is applauding him and thinks this was a really great race and everybody can feel Oh, this was something extra. It was really nice to see. Mm -hmm. I remember my first world championship when Lowell Bailey won won the twenty k. No, and Filsen, I think yes, I, I yes, and I saw people from all the teams crying. It was crazy. Everybody <laughs> was just yeah. so happy for him because he's this great guy and he never won this before. And I, I think those moments are very special. And I think that's the beauty of the. Of the sport and we talk a lot about this biathlon family but it is not a cliche i think it's very mm -hmm. true yeah yeah i think so too uh what annoys you the most about biathlon especially as an athlete uh, it must be if you think you have a good prone shooting but uh, you lift your elbow in a weird <laughs> position and everything is <laughs> just outside five shots at the same place but it's still uh, three penalty loops yeah <laughs> uh, 
happened rarely to you, right? Yeah, I'm more and more rarely, I would say. So yeah. uh, I'm happy with that. Okay. Until this point in time, what was your favorite moment in biathlon? My silver medal in Pyeongchang. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do or did you have any role models in biathlon or outside of biathlon, maybe other athletes? Yeah, I think I I tried to take the best from everyone. But when I was little, um, Beyond Allen was a great inspiration for me. Yeah. Petter Nordtug was, uh, I think, maybe the biggest idol I had. Uh, I liked the way he was finishing his races. But also for CAD, I mean, being consistent for that time period. And also, he was this guy who was so flexible. He could shoot fast, he could shoot slow, depending mm -hmm. on what he needed to do. And he could ski fast in the beginning of the race, or he could stay calm and be fast in the end. He was he was adapting a lot. And I think that's that shows what a great athlete he was. Yeah. And how is it uh, with Slatan? Is it uh, a special character <laughs> for the Swedish guys, for the Swedish athletes? <laughs> yeah, Slatan is Slatan is the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah as a Swedish, <laughs> I have to say it. Yeah, that's it's, what he uh, said. A yes. pity we won't see him this summer now in, yeah. when he has his, his injury. But uh, uh, he's he's uh, I think in many ways important for for the Swedish people. Yeah, funny character, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. So we got a little. Yeah, a little, uh, what is it? Two, in, uh, two other questions. <laughs> two other, it's not a question, it's more like um, a quest. Yeah. So uh, okay. now you can put together your best biathlete in the world and it doesn't matter if he or she is active, inactive, a man or a woman. Which attributes would you take and from whom? So I choose two persons. No, or... you can uh, also, you, you don't only have to say skiing and shooting, you can also say the character or the, ah, okay, the okay. punch the, on, on, the, on, the, on the last meters or something like that, you know? Yeah. What do you think a good biathlete needs? Yes, uh, but then I say uh, I take my old mentor Fredrik Lindstrom. His prone shooting the last year it was incredible good. Mm -hmm. And then I take, uh, like I said before, for for Cal, his way of adapting uh, yeah. to the mm -hmm. wind or the situation or the race itself. And then uh, I say, yeah, I'm I'm a Swiss. I say shooting in general from Hanover and uh, oh yes. <laughs> And, and then I say the ski speed of uh, Johannes Simsbo, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Seems deadly, yes. I think also uh, <laughs> uh, Dala, his uh, last loops. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I think he is one of these guys I don't want in a, in a final loop. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I can say that too. Yeah, maybe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe me. I, yeah. It would be a nice fight against him sometime. I'm sure we will have that sometime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure too. Sebastian, imagine you had a big billboard in a big city. Everyone can read it. Uh, which message would you write on that billboard? And um, yeah, it shouldn't be in commercial. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's hard questions here in the end. Uh, it's <laughs> big questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I would write something like stay active. Uh, mm -hmm. The people inspire people to do sports and uh, in, engage in sports. I think it's important. Uh, And I think it's good for everyone to to stay active, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that gives a lot of uh, positive benefits for for your life. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I think so too. So, yeah, that are the perfect final words I think to conclude this episode. Um, mm -hmm. But Sebastian, tell our audience where they can find you if they want to see more from you. I think you uh, are yeah active on Instagram, right? Yes, I think Instagram is the easiest way to get in touch with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sebastian, and then you have this, uh, what do you say, this under underline. Uh, step, underline, yeah. mm -hmm. and then my surname, uh, Samuelson. Yeah. So there you can reach me. I think I try to read the messages I get. Uh, yeah. Perfect. So uh, thank you very much for your time. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we wish you the best for the next season for the Olympics. And we hope you mm -hmm. stay healthy. Yes. Thank you for having me. It was nice time talking to you yeah thanks <laughs> bye 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 we hope you liked the interview with sebastian samuelson if you want to know more about sebastian follow him on instagram but also follow us on instagram and share this episode with your friends all of the links can be found in the show notes thank you very much and till the next time